So let me ask you this. How many of you are like me and have completely embraced the whole DVR experience? Oh my goodness. Do you know what DVR is? Like three of you. We need to talk. I mean, I maybe was a little bit full of hyperbole in the first service when I said it changed my life. And a lot of people are like, oh man, you gotta, you're not living for a lot. But um, yeah, this whole thing now that you don't have to be in front of the TV at eight o'clock for your show. You don't even have to watch commercials anymore. Amazing, right? Like, you can just push a couple buttons, and you can keep your schedule, do your things, and your show will be there, or your game will be there. I mean, it's, come on, guys. Does nobody do this? It's awesome. If you had a TV. If you had a TV. Well, hey, that, that is, a, that's true. But like, you remember, like, uh, remember when you had to be in front of the TV at 8 o'clock, and like, um, you had to sit through the commercials, and everybody had to be quiet because... If you missed it, you missed it. And um, I will tell you, though, that in this whole thing, I've actually been taught a really important lesson. DVR taught me a really important spiritual lesson. <laughs> you ready for this? Yeah. You know, I noticed that um, if I was busy and I couldn't watch, you know, an Iowa football game or an Iowa basketball game or... Um, I don't watch all the Cardinals games. There's 162. It's too many. But, um, right? No. no. Brad says no. That I knew that um, it would be there waiting when I had time. But I also noticed that in my personality, I would go ahead and already check the score. Now, some of you, I even talked to somebody this weekend, like we were talking about something weird, a game, and they're like, yeah, I'm going to go home and watch that. And he looked at me and said, don't you dare tell me what the score is. I'm not like that at all. I want to know. Like, I want to know real time what happened. And so often, I didn't get to watch the Iowa football game, but I already knew they won 27 to, you know, 20. It's always about seven points with Iowa. It's just terrible. 27-20. And so, you know what? I realized that when I would go back and watch the game, there was a difference between when I watched a DVR game and when I watched it live. Like watching it live, I didn't know what was going to happen. And my stress level's way up here when it's, you know, we're down by 14 points. And what's going to happen? I'm, you know, I noticed that when I was watching the game DVR and I already knew the score, I actually kind of enjoyed it when we were down 14 <laughs> points. I'm like, hey, watch this. This is going to be good. Like, I wasn't stressed out anymore. I wasn't. I wasn't anxious. I knew we won. Even though it looked pretty dire, you know, the Cardinals are down to two strikes. Uh, this is it. Last pitch. We're out. But I know we won the game. And it doesn't matter if we're down by two runs right then. I watched this in a whole different way. It's kind of like when you watch your favorite movies and shows a second and third and fourth time, right? Like you live into and lean into those moments, even those moments of uh, the times when your character or the story is tense and tight and you know, the main character is up against it and it's, it seems impossible. Like watching it again and knowing what happens, it changes the whole reality of what you're in right then. Like you actually enjoy the struggle, you enjoy the whole movie. You relax. You, or the, the game, you're like, all right, not good now, but I know we win. Right? I want you to use that as context as we talk about this theme of this season that all of us are very familiar with, right? Um, this little word, J-O-W, joy. Little word, huge impact, right? It's a joy that you see did I, did I spell it wrong? <laughs> and this is the one that's live. Oh my goodness, this is gonna be clipped up. I'm never gonna live over this. Yeah, somebody's gonna DVR it. 
J O W. Or no. I'm stuck. J O Y. Joy. Woo! Oh my goodness. I am so toast. Oh, good grief. I mean, it's a word that's found everywhere this season, right? Signs, advertisements, it's in windows, it's in lawns. Uh, you see the word, I mean, this is one of the words of the season. Actually, I think it's the word of the season. You know, actually, our faith, the Christian faith, has thousands and thousands and thousands upon thousands of songs, right? Because this faith is joyful in nature. We sing about our faith. And it's actually not any different in this season, even culturally, a huge part of the Christmas season is music. And that music is, it's always joyful, is it not? It's the most wonderful time of the year, right? And like, you know, um, all these songs that you hear, there's always this, this joyful kind of feel to the Christmas music that we play, even in our culture. Unless it's the one song, The Christmas Shoes. Are you familiar with this song? Can we please stop playing that song? I mean, your mojo is just so good, like seven straight, you're into the season, and all of a sudden they play this Christmas shoes song, and I'm crying, right? But it's, it's the theme of the season. It's the theme of the story used eight times in the Christmas story as the writers are helping us understand how Jesus came to earth. Joy is a big part of what they write about. It's why we say Merry Christmas and not Scary Christmas, right? <laughs> Merry Christmas. But I'm interested in tapping in a little bit into our psyche today about how we understand joy. How many of you would be honest that when I say the word joy, J-O-Y, that one of the first things that you think of is emotion. How, much, how many of you would raise your hand and say that? Just naturally. Right? Emotion. To be joyful is to, to have good feelings. Right? A lot of you aren't being honest. I think our culture has prepped us to think that way. That joy is an emotion that we experience. And that's why in this season where, you know, the world especially, they look forward to this time because honestly in a dog-eat-dog, -dog, rat race world that's lost and broken, it's something to look forward to, to, to celebrate something, the festivities and the parties and the gift giving and the gift receiving and, and the, the music's just trying to, to lift up the spirits and give us this kind of joy. But I would say that it's in an emotional framework. Right? And joy is so often characterized in the realm of emotion. And either I'm, I'm feeling good and I'm joyful, or I'm feeling bad and I don't have any joy. It's kind of the reality of our world. Let me define joy for you from a dictionary. It's a sense of well-being, a state of mind. A combination of emotions, contentment, confidence, hope, delight, and satisfaction. I, they did a great job, even in Webster's, of defining joy. It includes emotion. It would be silly for me to stand up here and talk about joy and not say that part of joy, a part of joy, oftentimes includes good emotion. Right? But is joy an emotion that we're striving to always live into these good feelings, these joyful experiences where, hey, that's, that's what God's calling us to is just to always sense joy, to, to, to feel good. I would submit to you that we've, we've misunderstood joy and we blended it too often with the word happiness. Happiness is an emotion that can disappear quickly and come back and, 
Happiness is related to happenings. The core word for happiness is hap, which is a word that basically conveys the idea of chance. Happiness is related to happenstance. It's, it's the attitude or satisfaction or delight based upon present circumstances. Right? Hey, I'm with you. I like to experience happiness. And I know what it is for things to be going good in my week and for me to be happy. And I also know what it is to have things go bad in my week. And I'm going to be frank with you. I am not happy. Right? Happiness is tied to circumstances. I sense I'm happy when it's good. And if you're like me, you're not happy when your car breaks down. Come on. Seriously. And if you are, you probably need to go see somebody. <laughs> Your distorted sense of reality. It's okay to be happy and not happy, right? And unfortunately, too often we think of joy in the same realm. Joy is, in the scriptures, this word charis that is... Um, from the root word shara, which is closely related with the Greek word charis, which is grace. Joy and grace are just intertwined. I would say from scripture, the idea of talking about joy is in this way. Joy is a gift that God brings into our life as well as a response to the gifts that God gives us. Joy comes when we're aware of God's grace and relish in his favor. Or I would say it this way, one of the statements today I want to make to you is joy is the result of the celebration of grace. And I would say actually that in my life I've noticed that a lack of joy is connected to a lack of, of an awareness of grace. When I lose sight of the grace of God, this unmerited favor, this disposition of God, which he's always moving toward me, always graciously inviting me to him, always willing to forgive, always merciful. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm saying always too. Because a part of grace is this always, this constant, this has said from the Old Testament, loving faithfulness of God, that when I lose sight of that, then I lose sight of joy. So often. But when I live in that reality, when I understand my position, my place, my relationship with God as his child, it's very hard for me to lose joy when I have an understanding of God's grace. But I would tell you that joy is not created from within us. It's sent to us by the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. That in our, especially in the season, our work up to try to, to make ourselves joyful and feel good and it's the most wonderful time of the year. We fall short so often, so we turn to so many substitutes because we realize that true abiding joy is not something that can be fabricated or made within us. It's something we receive from God himself. It's a grace, grace gift. I mean, think about the words we sung this morning. Joy to the world. What brings that joy? The Lord has come. Okay? It, think about it this way. I got a, a little chart maybe to, you know, what you see, what you hear, it sticks. So happiness is external. It's circumstantial. It's chance, right? I mean, we don't like to think of it that way, but it truly is. It's random at times and good things happen to bad people. Bad things happen to good people. It's and happiness so often is in that. 
Joy is an internal thing that God brings into our life regardless of circumstance. It's Christ-centered. That as you and I are in relationship with Christ, the promise is you and I can experience joy. It becomes a constant part of our life. It's a choice. In fact, if you don't get anything else today, except for J-O-W, I know. <laughs> I've totally messed up. I'm so, I'm so frustrated with myself. <laughs> anyway, I want you to grab a hold of this, this definition of joy that honestly sets the parameters for me in my own life. Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of my life. The quiet confidence that ultimately everything will be all right. And because of that, it becomes the determined choice to praise God in all things. Settled assurance, quiet confidence, determined choice. The essence of what joy is, is this gift from God that comes as we experience relationship with him that is constant, that is faithful. It doesn't go anywhere. And regardless of circumstances are happy or good or bad, the promise is that you and I can live with this underlying joy in our lives. Settled assurance, quiet confidence, and determined choice. In fact, I want you to ponder this statement. I believe this is true. Joy doesn't come from what you have, but from what you know can't be taken away. If you have a personality like me, I'm always waiting for the shoe to drop. I'm always waiting for, like, life is, it's random. Like, bad things happen to good people. Think of myself as good. I, I get it. But, you know, I'm always looking around the corner for the next thing. I always want to be prepared. That's just my personality. Half full kind of guy. And I found out in my life that it would steal my joy over and over. The anxiety, the worry, the unknown, the uncertainty would just rob any joy I had because I was just preparing myself for the next thing that was going to happen to me. I needed to be ready. Now I begin to realize that there's some things in my life that cannot be taken away from me. <laughs> Isn't that what Romans 8 talks about? Nothing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then he goes on to that list, neither hide, the, you know, all those things. I begin to realize my joy, it remained in my heart because I realized there were some things that were, I ain't going anywhere. I don't need to worry. I don't need to be uncertain. So I would tell you, joy doesn't come from what you have, but what you know can't be taken away. I mean, think about this little illustration. Imagine that you're a billionaire. You're in New York City. You're taking a cab to a meeting. You get in the cab, you take the ride, you get out, the fare is $10. You have three tens in your pocket. You pay the cab driver, you walk into your meeting. Later that day, you reach into your pocket to, to buy a coffee and you realize that you must have given him $20 instead of 10. You handed him two tens instead of the one. You only have one 10 left. Be honest with me, what's your response? You shrug your shoulders. Some of you don't. <laughs> you're so tight. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you're a billionaire. Like <laughs> You're going after that $10. <laughs> but normally, most of us would just be like, okay. Like for us, like a penny. Do I admit that? That I don't pick up every penny. Right? I mean... You're not going to get upset. You're not going to go to the police and demand they search the city. No, you're going to shrug. You're a billionaire. You've lost $10. So what? You're too rich. You're too wealthy to be concerned with that kind of loss. I think in the same way, Christians often lose sight of all that we have in Jesus. This is the reason 
Paul prays that we as Christians would have the spiritual ability to grasp the height, depth, breadth, and length of God's love, which is in Christ Jesus. Like he just prays, can you tap into that? Can you lean into that a little bit? Can you allow that to become the framework for which you see the rest of your life? You are a spiritual billionaire. And when things come into your life, when hurts or wounds or things go backwards and don't work out like you thought they would and you've planned and you've hoped and I'm sorry guys, I'm spitting. Um, <laughs> you probably can see that in all the lights in the haze, but um, you know, like all that stuff, like so often we allow the fact that those things happen to us to just become all we can see. All the while we're spiritual billionaires, blessed with every spiritual blessing is what the book of Ephesians tells us. This becomes the reason why you and I can be joyful people. Good, bad, ugly, indifferent, mundane, joy. Because of who we are. Look at Mary. Luke chapter one is the text we're looking at today. Mary has just found out the news. She knows what's gonna happen. She shared with her cousin, and now it's dawning on her what's about to take place. And Mary writes these words, or she doesn't write these words, she sings these words, they were recorded later. It's become an important piece of scripture. And here's how she opens this. Mary says, my soul glorifies. This word glorified, it's, it's got a mega to it. It's like over the top, like unrestrained, like I'm going to stand in the middle of the street and just rejoice. I'm going to glorify the Lord. It's an overwhelming, intense kind of word that Mary is singing. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit, here's that word, joy, rejoices in God, my Savior. And this word is, again, a grandiose, overwhelming kind of thing, kind of an annoying kind of joy. You ever meet those people in your life? They're just so positive. Now you know how I am. Like, I'm like, come on, can you just be real with me for just a minute? Are you really that happy all the time? Right? Like, you know, those, we need those people in our lives, don't get me wrong. But like, man, I'm on an island here. Everybody, but like, like, she's just overwhelmingly positive about this. She is, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. These beautiful words that are sung, that are a key part of how we understand Mary, I want you to think about as she's singing these words, the reality of her situation. According to the text, um, the reality of the situation is she's 13, 14, 15. She's pregnant. But the thing is, is when mom and dad ask her, oh, she's not married. And then she's gonna say that I'm pregnant with a baby that's not even the person I'm engaged to, right? Like these circumstances are not favorable. Like then she's going to not only bear the shame from the community of an unplanned, unwed pregnancy from somebody not your betrothed or your engaged person. That's shameful, scandalous enough. She's going to have the audacity to look at people and say, yeah, well, who's the father? God. 
I mean, she's, I mean, her, she's staring at circumstances that are unbelievable. She is not only going to be shamed, but she's going to be counted as someone who needs to go to the mental ward. Right? She's dealing with the relationship with Joseph that someone she loves and cares for who's going to look at her in the eye and say, What? Who no doubt, even as the angel appears to him, is still, come on, guys, think about it. This doesn't happen. We know how babies are born. You're going to tell me one out of millions and millions, you're the, you're the exception. Right? Mary is staring at disgrace, being an outcast. Honestly, there's an outside chance that she could be stoned. Remember the woman in adultery? It was caught in John chapter 8. They still practice some of that. I mean, maybe not, but she was in a, an area that maybe. I mean, you know how it goes. All these things go through your mind, right? Like, I get a, should I admit this? I get a parking ticket the other day. <laughs> I watched the guy put it on my, th- my window. I'm like, what? I just put things in there. I go out. I was on the yellow line, so I was considered double parked. But as I'm walking out there, my mind's going crazy. It just cost yourself 150 bucks. You put, you know how it is, how our minds do that? No doubt Mary's mind was like into entertaining all sorts of possibilities. Needless to say that for her, to stand and sing with unrestrained and unreserved joy is ludicrous, it seems like. Because her circumstances are not favorable. And I would remind you that what she's helping us understand, what she is an example of many, many, many times in Scripture, is joy is not dependent upon our circumstances. Happiness might be, but joy isn't. When the scriptures talk about joy, it's talking about something that is present well beyond whether things are going well and are favorable or they're going bad. Right? Think about her singing this song before she's moving into this pregnancy, the the second and third trimester. It's kind of the idea in the Old Testament, Zephaniah, that minor prophet, Judean prophet, who um, he is a prophet in a time when the children of Israel are um, being held captive, slave to Assyria. It is dark, it is bleak, there is no hope. And in the middle of that, Zephaniah stands up and looks at the people, tells the people who are facing injustice, oppression. They're fearful, they're ashamed. It's all the things. And he says this, sing aloud, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Rejoice and exult with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. What? Not me. Look around. It's why Paul, writing to the church in Philippi, the church in Philippi was facing external conflict and pressures and internal strife. It was not a fun church to go to. You felt the tension when you walked in the building. It's in the middle of that, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Be joyful. Again, I say rejoice. It's why Jesus, when he's given the Beatitudes and calling us to a lifestyle that looks different than the world and will be not popular in the world, he actually says this, that when you live through that, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. It's why in Corinthians, as Paul is writing to people who are in the midst of a very severe trial, he says that in the midst of their very severe trial, they had overflowing joy. That's why James actually says this, consider it pure joy. My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance, 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Bad circumstance, pure joy. Why? Because the joy that God gives is not dependent upon your circumstances. It's not circumstantial. I love to feel good and happy. And I believe that living with the settled assurance and the quiet confidence and the determined choice of what joy is, that it brings a lot of positive emotions to my life. But guess what? When things are not good and circumstances are not favorable, the joy of the Lord continues to reside underpinning my life. That's why the scriptures say it's the joy of the Lord is your what? Your strength. And Mary reminds us that joy is not dependent upon our circumstance. Listen to as she continues in this little couple verses. We see this. That joy actually springs from God's salvation. My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Mary understood that although her social status would never change, she was, she's revered now, she wasn't revered then. She never became some kind of earthly queen She maintained the same social status. She had the same friends. In fact, even at the cross, Jesus is making sure that she's taken care of economically. Nothing changed for her in this life. But you know what did change? The salvation of her soul. My spirit rejoices in God, what? My Savior. And joy springs from God's Salvation. Think about what Matthew 13, 44 would say. Jesus is sharing this parable of, of a man, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again, and then in his joy went and sowed all that he had and bought that field. The biggest deal in your life, the biggest challenge you'll ever face, the most the thing you need most is your soul to be saved from its sin. And because Mary understood that Jesus was the Savior, the only, only response is joy. Paul, or David would share in the Psalms, restore unto me the joy of your salvation. Joy comes as we experience what it is to have ourselves in right relationship with God, saved, forgiven from our sins, and new life in Christ in our lives. In fact, I would say this. Because of this, living with joy occurs when my perspective interprets my circumstances rather than my circumstances determining my perspective. Back to the DVR thing. I knew how it was going to end. That made all the difference. It didn't matter how bad we were down or how badly we were getting beaten. We were going to win. And so too, the salvation that the Lord offers to us. There is this underlying joy, regardless of circumstance, regardless of setback, regardless of suffering, that as I am in him, the game has, or the life has already been won. Amen. Amen. Can you allow that to frame everything you see today, how you see what you're going through, how you see your life? Look, The big deal's been taken care of. It's gonna be okay. The last thing, I'm just gonna read through it. It's 11.55. Jonathan, if you'd come ahead. Joy exists in living out God's will. 
Mary would go on to talk about how she was going to be this servant that generations from now would all call her blessed because of how she was going to serve the Lord. Joy comes in being used by God and living out his will. Mary reminds us of that. In fact, it was Jesus himself who said this in, in Hebrews chapter 12. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That even as he faced bearing the sins of the whole world, there was underlying joy in Jesus' heart because he knew he was living out the will of the Father. And the will of the Father was good. Amen. Acts 2.28 as Peter's preaching that first sermon he says you're the one that helps us to know the paths of life and as we know the paths of life you fill us with joy in your presence as we walk out your will it's John 15 it says verse 10 if you keep my commands you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love I have told you this what? so that, your, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Mary reminds us that joy exists in living out God's will. There's probably a lot of artificial happiness that exists in Christmas. There's a lot of sadness, but there's a lot of artificial happiness. People have not received the joy that comes from the Lord. This joy that is a settled assurance, a quiet confidence, a determined choice because of what he's done and who I am, that regardless of circumstances, I can praise the Lord always, rejoice always, because it is ultimately going to be okay. Father, I pray that we would have this kind of framework of joy. I love joyful emotions. But Lord, what I need most, what we need most is the joy of the Lord being that stable, steadying part of our life that I can praise God regardless if my circumstances are good, bad, and different because he's taking care of the things that I need most. He's not gonna forsake me. And what awaits me is the fulfillment of everything that is right and good and what he's promised. Lord, help us to be joyful people, but that joy comes not from circumstances, it comes from an abiding, abiding relationship with you, the giver of joy. Make it so, I pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. Have a great week.